who will um, compile the uh, results of the discussion and report back on them what has been discussed. Okay. Um, so I will start with um, a presentation um, of who we are. Starting with this. Um, the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation was launched two years ago, uh, in Nairobi. And the objective was to put together an um, initiative which is going to bring donors, governments and private sector together for one purpose, and that is to implement the trade facilitation agreement. We are financed by five donor countries, um, the United States, Canada, Germany, United Kingdom, and Australia. And we have at our core a number of private sector companies who provide contribution in kind. The best way I have to describe this is a consortium. So we are a consortium of government and private sector working together for a common objective. We also have a secretariat which itself is formed by four organizations. Show you the detail after. Our activities are closely coupled to the TFA, so we have a look at TFA articles and we respond to the different um, articles and design what we see are as highly focused, responding to clear needs, projects that seek to uh, define outcomes and are compatible with other trade initiatives. And I'll give you a few examples um, later. So the idea really is to think about projects very well defined, encapsulated, which will resolve knots in the supply chain. So we will go into a country, work with governments to identify the knots and try and entangle these, these knots. This is how we are structured. In the middle you will see the Secretariat, which is formed by the International Chamber of Commerce, the World Economic Forum, the Center for International Private Enterprise, and GIZ. Four organizations are very different, with very different capacities in terms of leveraging, leveraging private sector, experience in developing countries, experience working with governments. On the left, you have the five other countries which I mentioned. And on the right, these are our current private sector partners who have been with us, um, working um, very closely with us for the past two years many of which are, are present here today and will be able to contribute to this discussion. And when we say that we work closely with the private sector, we are not limiting ourselves to interfacing or creating dialogue with the private sector. We are incorporating private sector at the core of what we're doing. We're embedding the private sector. And we're embedding private sector at a number of levels. We have we call a steering group, which provides our general strategy and guidance, approves projects, approves budgets. This steering group is composed of representatives from both the donor community and the private sector. On the left-hand side, we have a number of working groups, which themselves are, um, in, in which we also have the private sector embedded, and to many, to many, in many ways, lead these, these working groups. We have what we call the pipeline working group, where we have we're following development of projects, identifying champions in country to establish projects. We have what we call the metrics working group. What we are looking at is trying to extract data in the supply chain and use this to be able to assess our performance. We then also use the private sector to help us implement projects. Um, and how do we do that? Well, we have examples of um, companies such as Merck, for example, who provided us a methodology that they had developed internally, and they're providing that as contribution in kind. We have companies who, are, who have provided us, provided us with um, resources, um, which are seconded to the, to the Alliance. And we are, as we grow, looking at other ways in which the private sector can really come into the, into the process. And the last bit, the last part, very importantly, is the assessment of our performance. And we are very much an outcome impact driven initiative. 
And the bet we are making is that if the private sector that we have improved the business climate and reduced the clearance time, then we have won our bet. So as you see, the private sector is really completely embedded into the entity organization. We have a number of guiding principles. Firstly, we operate in countries which are fully committed to trade facilitation. What does that mean? That means generally um, they have ratified the TFA or are about to ratify it, are showing genuine um, um, involvement and, and commitment. We've very committed ourselves to what is called, we call co creation. And that is, instead of thinking up a project and trying to push this into a country, is working from the bottom up. Working in terms of developing a dialogue between government and private sector, and from that emerges a project. And if the idea is that if we have a project, a concrete project that emerges from that, by definition, you will have acceptance from everybody, and it will be easier to implement. We design projects which are which have clear-cut objectives and boundaries. We prefer to have small projects which are clearly defined rather than wide-ranging projects which lack of the definition. And I mentioned, as I mentioned, we are leveraging to a high level of the private sector expertise. The last point is we call metrics and measurements. This is something that hasn't really been done so far, and we're, we're experimenting to a large extent. We're trying to see if we can use data within customs, within the ports, within the private sector, and use that data to help us identify where these knots are, and then assess how successful we are subsequently. A couple of examples then in terms of, of what we do. Um, we categorize our projects into three different uh, um, stages. Um, these are the projects that we are currently implementing. Our most advanced is, um, is Vietnam. We have two projects in Colombia. Um, we have um, one project in Ghana, one in Kenya, and one in Sri Lanka that we're implementing. It should be approved this week, but technically it's not yet implemented. It will be starting sometime next year. Just to give you an example of what we're talking about, um, Vietnam, for example, they have major issues with port congestion, trying to decongest the ports. And what we have found is, despite the fact that some imports have got customs clearance, they're unable to clear the goods because they're expecting permits from other government agencies. And what we're implementing is a conditional release regime, where we can release the goods despite not having all the paperwork finalized, and that is covered by a customs bond and we're working with the insurance companies to be able to manage that. In Colombia, we're working with the uh, Food and Drugs Administration, IVA, in terms of implementing a simple risk management system to reduce inspection rates from 100% to 70%. It's a small project, but very effective. We're also, in Colombia, implementing a unit, a unit within customs to handle advanced, um, advanced bullets <laughs> for, the, uh, for the automotive industry. This is quite an ambitious um, um, project, and it's aimed at really creating uh, predictability and consistency in terms of clearance of the goods, depending on which point of entry they're coming in from. In Ghana and Kenya, we're working on pre-arrival processing, we have risk management, and trying to front load a lot of the processing of declarations before the goods arrive. And finally, Sri Lanka is a fantastic project, which is aimed at implementing a um, multi-country consolidation hub what does that mean? It means acquiring goods from different parts of South Asia, consolidating them in Sri Lanka, and pushing those into full container loads up to, um, to Europe and, and to the States, which will hopefully create a lot of foreign direct investment. We're designing projects in countries such as Brazil, Argentina, where we are today. We had a successful event this morning with the Argentinian community, Dominican Republic, Morocco, uh, Myanmar, and we are planning in total 20 countries where we are moving ahead with our projects. I won't go over all of them. They might not all materialize, but this is the plan um, we have today. And depending on how things evolve, the commitment we have from government and the private sector, we will uh, we will make those the reality. <coughs> so that's basically what I have for you in terms of a general overview of what is. Alliance. I will now move on to the second part and I will introduce you to some number of people who will give you a general uh, statement from, from their perspective. Firstly, I'd like to, to 
to welcome Mr. Dominic Ziller, who is the Director General of International Development and Policy, the Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development of the Federal Republic of Germany. Mr. Ziller. Yes, So two years ago, in the immediate aftermath of these two conferences, the Addis Conference and uh, um, the uh, conference in Nairobi, uh, Germany has partnered up with Canada, with Australia, with the United States and the United Kingdom in the Global Alliance. You just mentioned us. So thank you. Um, and we launched it in Nairobi at, at uh, the uh, ministerial conference and afterwards we, we started the real work. And since then, we also have launched a German alliance. Um, which is a bit the sister alliance. We talked about it this morning with the Argentinians. Um, it's a bit, yeah, the same family, but there we try to bring in the very specific experience um, of uh, the German enterprises. And uh, um, um, if, if I think if we can put together the two alliances in, in the same projects and on the same page as we do here in Argentina, we will even um, um, double uh, the input that we can provide. Both these initiatives aim to bring governments and the business community together to coordinate and accelerate the trade facilitation reforms the agreement asks us to undertake and to implement the agreement. Um, in 2015, a public-private partnership of uh, this scope, of this dimension, was something entirely new. I don't think that it has ever been done before. And um, with that in mind, you can say that the, cons the, the considerable achievements that we have made in these just two years, you've mentioned all the countries. Um, if, you look at, if you look at the, 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 the global um, map, you see lots of red dots and lots of green dots, and we're about to cover a lot of, of partner countries. And I think that these combined resources of the organizations involved, you mentioned all of them, um, will contribute a lot to the future um, success of the Alliance. We have the World Economic Forum on board, that's very important, the International Chamber of Commerce, GIZ, the Center for International Private Enterprise, and they have all delivered on the uh, substantial task of building um, an institutional framework and develop project implementation methodologies. Um, Certainly, these, these cannot be the same for each and every country and each and every project. And I think that's the good thing that these alliances provide. First of all, well, there are a few things we, we come across in almost all the partner countries. So there we can, we can have uh, solutions um, which can be applied um, in other countries as well. Lessons learned in one country can be applied to other countries. But then we also have the tailor-made things um, which we need for the specific um, projects in specific countries. In Ghana, we work together with uh, the Ghanaian Ministry of Trade and Industry um, and uh, all stakeholders that are involved in trade facilitation to further improve the Ghanaian risk management system and to introduce an electronic pre-arrival processing, just as uh, one quick example of what the Alliance does. And um, 
um, uh, in cooperation with DHL, to give you another example, and the Montenegrin Customs Administration, uh, we have also implemented a project that has managed to double the percentage of goods that is released directly upon arrival from 25 to somewhat, uh, somewhere around 50 percent since early 2016. So in just two years, double the percentage of goods that is released immediately that, don't, um, uh, that are not stored in, in customers for weeks and months. And this was so impressive also to the neighboring countries that we're now looking to roll it out to Serbia and other countries. That's something the German Alliance did and with DHL, Steve Pope, thank you very much, played a very important role. So I think I started with the momentum um, the Trade Facilitation Agreement created. Um, the momentum is still there and uh, with uh, the negotiations at the Hilton across the road uh, being um, somewhat stuck, um, this gives all the more reason to us to work on the things that can be done even independently from um, the legal framework uh, that the WTO might or might not decide upon here in, in Buenos Aires or at other ministerial conferences. I think we have proven with this alliance that, that we can go ahead and that we can, uh, especially me being not from a trade ministry but from development cooperation ministry, especially live up to what we promised as uh, developed countries in Addis Abeba um, to do in order to support our partners in the developing countries um, um, uh, in order to make trade work and um, make trade an important, much more important part of sustainable development than it has been in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ziller, for these, these, this great message. I will pass over the mic um, to Mrs. Virginia Brown, who is the Director of the Office of Trade and Regulatory Reforms at USAID. Uh, Virginia has been an instigator of this um, um, alliance uh, over two and a half years ago, at the, the very start of this, of, of this, 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 this new idea. Um, Virginia, I pass, you, pass the floor over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it is hard to believe that two years have gone by since, since we launched the Alliance, and I have to uh, also say what Mr. Ziller said, to see all the countries up there is really uh, shows how much progress that we've made. I wanted to just share with you some thoughts of behind why we pursued this type of arrangement, why we pursued the Global Alliance. And that's because USAID had a, a long history of helping countries get into the WTO. We consider the WTO accession efforts that we did as a, as a big um, success story for us. We helped many, many countries get into the WTO. We then also helped countries implement WTO agreements. But what we were finding was a lot of the countries were saying, we've implemented, it's great, and the government felt very successful, yet our, our private sector and the private sector around the world and in our host countries were coming to us and saying, wait a minute, nothing changed. They say they've implemented this agreement, they've declared victory, but we didn't see any change. And in fact, in some cases, our time and cost to do business has actually increased and not decreased. So we felt that TFA, with the commitment um, from developed countries to help on implementation and the idea that the way the agreement was set up with the category C's to have a dialogue about the time it's going to take to implement individual provisions, that this allowed us an opportunity to deliver assistance completely differently. Traditionally, we would just uh, compete a big contract, give it to what we call a Beltway Bandit in, in Washington, D.C., one of our big contractors, and send them off to help with implementation. But we decided that was not the model that we wanted to use, that we really wanted to get the private sector in to help on implementation, commit to be a partner in implementation, because this is the part that's sometimes missed. That the government can put out all the rules, but if the private sector doesn't have the capacity to implement the rules and implement them in a cost-effective manner, then really this is not going to be successful. So that was our idea of the alliance, and we set out to find partners. You've heard the countries that, that joined us, and the, you saw up there the organizations that have joined us as well. So really I think what's key is the, the, the private sector is a full-fledged partner here. They're going to they're gonna succeed or fail with us. I'm glad about that. Um, 
but also the important thing that was even mentioned earlier as well, and that's the metrics. Some of the metrics that we've traditionally used in our assistance programs are really just metrics within that program, and candidly in many cases designed so that the contractor can always say, we succeeded as well. And it wasn't built on real concrete commercial information to show success or failure. And that's what the Alliance is going to do for us, especially with WEF on the metric side. They're, they're able to get um, real-time business information so that we're going to be able to show that, we, that this was successful from the business point of view, but also from the, the government point of view in terms of implementation. So thank you for coming and thank you in advance for sharing your ideas about how we can make this better, other ways we can engage with the private sector in this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Virginia. I have another speaker who I would like to introduce you to, to is Ambassador Kumar Aratne, who is the Sri Lankan ambassador to, to WTO, who has uh, kindly accepted to get out of his negotiations and, and, and join us. <coughs> Perhaps you can uh, give us a few words, Ambassador. Thank you. Let me extend my, first of all, uh, my thanks to well, uh, the Global Alliance as well as the sponsors of this program. Uh, let me share that, you know, the, what we have done with regard to TFA and where we are and uh, how we uh, look forward to this PPP uh, engagement. And, uh, and uh, first of all, I thank uh, Global Alliance, Select in Sri Lanka, on the first 10, uh, as one of the first 10 countries uh, to launch one of their programs. And uh, of course, smaller country like Sri Lanka, it's very, very important for us to see how best we can improve our competitiveness. And we consider TFA provide us a kind of an edge where we can seriously consider. And Sri Lanka is located very well, connecting east and west. And therefore, probably we had to look for what factors that give us the, this competitive edge. Therefore, we consider location is one of the main factors that we can capitalize on. And good example is we handle annually around mm -hmm. 6 million containers, 20 foot containers. 70% is transit. Right? That give us, a, I think, uh, thanks, you know, I can see the, a lot of private sector representative, including MERS. I think they know very well the statistics. And the, of course, uh, the, when we concluded our, uh, the agreement, uh, TFA agreement, and what we have done is we try to uh, liaise with all the institutions who are working with us. And as a result, I have been able to convene a meeting in Geneva, inviting all the institutions. That is where the uh, Global Alliance came in as well. And we had a meeting with WTO, ITC, UNCTAD, and uh, UN ECOSOC, and, and uh, some other representative base in Geneva. Then I asked, you know, please let us know what you all are doing, because they have been doing different parts of the program, including USA. And the, see, see that, you know, the, to understand what they are doing relating to trade facilitation. And finally, we managed everyone to, uh, uh, to get on board. And as a result, and uh, I think we decided to, as the principal coordinator, uh, the as, uh, World Bank as the principal coordinator of this, our trade facilitation. And now, of course, uh, World Bank is involved in a big way. And we have identified three areas. One is single window to facilitate the custom process. And the second one is trade portal where the information can be accessed. And the third one is NTFC, National uh, Committee on Trade Facilitation. And we got a lot of private sector in. And then now we are actually in a, in a, in a moving process that uh, we have been already working on that. Uh, and the, with regard to Global Alliance, I'm very happy to note and uh, about their projects that they have already conceptualized and the, uh, the multi-cargo consolidation hub. And this is very well matched with our requirement. 
and uh, Sri Lanka at the moment working with many uh, the multinational companies procuring various products from the neighboring countries and consolidating them in Colombo and, and shipping to them. And this can be a very uh, uh, great opportunity for us uh, if we can develop the, this uh, facilities for that kind of operation in a proper manner. Therefore, this, uh, their concept or their project is very, very uh, valuable to us. What I gathered and what I so far, I would just like to briefly mention about this project. Probably, uh, the particular private sector already represented here, they can find a, maybe a niche where they can uh, give their expertise to us or leverage their expertise to, for the success of this pr uh, program. And uh, this, uh, this program has three phases. First one is, you know, the basically making the ground environment, and then the second phase is making the legal uh, uh, background in, uh, incomparable with the, you know, the system that they are going to introduce, and they are working on that, and uh, and uh, what we can uh, visualize is the great engagement of private sector. I think there are a couple of members uh, from my country as well as the private sector that of course through the Global Alliance and they are working together very well on this project. And, and once the necessary legal infrastructure is in place, that it, this next one is the scale up or operational side, right? Uh, then this will uh, provide a, a great opportunity for a smaller country like Sri Lanka to increase uh, their exports as well as competitiveness of our exports as well as facilitating the trade uh, between the you know the countries that we are dealing with and uh, as far as our trade is concerned over 60 percent of our trade is with US and EU right therefore they together uh, EU and uh, US and EU accounts for 60 percent of our trade therefore this facilitation exercise has very well direct benefit to the country uh, since our trade is focused on these two major markets. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. We were supposed to have two additional speakers. Uh, we had the Vice Minister of uh, Foreign Trade of Colombia and the Chairman of the NTFC of Ghana. Unfortunately, they both had to decline at the last minute because they are caught up in, in, in the negotiations. So they, uh, they apologize, but uh, th they would have loved to be with us. Uh, but unfortunately, they, 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 they're not able to join us. Um, when it comes to working with private sector, there are some difficulties, of course. And in, we've often been um, called an experiment. And to a large extent, we have been an experiment until, un until recently. I hope we're moving away from that now um, and trying to prove that and proving that, that we're able to, to deliver. But you know, working with the private sector is not always um, straightforward. Um, there are some practical uh, complications. I mean, we're working with you know, global companies here, but we, we deal with one person, then you have to deal with the local offices, you have to deal with the, the complications within the private sector. Um, and then, you know, what, how do you leverage the private sector? What expertise do you, do, 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 you, do you extract from the private sector? How do you go about that? And so, in the past year, we have been trying to do a number of things in order to be able to be successful at that. And we're slowly getting there, but I think there's a lot more that can be done in terms of, of, get, of getting there. Um, and these are the sort of things that we need to discuss. Um, I think that, that, that we all agree that the, the concept will work. How do we move um, forward? The other aspect is you know, when you're in country, you need to work with local companies, with SMEs, etc. How do we leverage the local companies, the SMEs, who no, don't necessarily have the bandwidth that some of these large companies have to be able to put someone at disposal of the alliance? How do you work with that? So these a couple of points just to get us started into the discussion. Um, and this is where um, you know, I'll pass it over to you to have a discussion at your tables. And basically, there are two questions which we would like to, to answer. The first one is, what are some of the lessons learned from your experience in public-private collaboration on trade facilitation? If you could come up with two or three examples. And the second question is looking forward, what are the ways forward for further leveraging the private sector in trade facilitation? Any innovative new ideas that we could think about in order to see how best we can use what is embedded in the private sector to help us. We had an interesting discussion this morning with Colombia, um, at the private sector, and what we said was, you know, 
private sector, you, you often complain that government is slow and not doing the right things, etc. We are in a situation now where the political situation is very conducive for trade facilitation. And so, private sector has got a responsibility to get involved. Now is the opportunity to do so. And so, you know, don't sit on the fence, get involved and bring, on, bring, bring your capacity to help us all achieve our goals. Because in the end, we all have the same goal. So I'll pass it over now to the tables. We have 20 or 30 minutes um, and we have the facilitators who and the, the I think we have a couple of people to kickstart the discussions and then <clears throat> after 20 or 30 minutes we will debrief on this. Thank you. <laughs> over to you. <laughs> Yes, I'm going to get them. <laughs> Self-identify. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, so I'll just tell you what we've been doing, and maybe that will get things. I'm going to get this guy. Salut, <laughs> Sherry.